Dr. Wong received her PhD in sociology with a graduate certificate in gender and sexuality studies from the University of Chicago in 2018. Her research interests include gender, marriage and family, work, health, aging, and the life course. Dr. Wong's research is motivated by this major research question, how do the seemingly private decisions and interactions in couples and families relate to broader patterns of inequality from young adulthood to later life? I'll hand it to Dr. Wong. And here's a mug from the life course. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, do people feel comfortable with me unmasking while I give my talk? Okay, thank you. All right, um, thank you all um, very much for inviting me to speak in the seminar series. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I wanna acknowledge that I am visiting Dakota land and I wanna observe a moment of silence for Amir Locke. Thank you everyone. Um, today, I am sharing work from my forthcoming book, Equal Partners, How Dual Professional Couples Make Career, Relationship, and Family Decisions. Um, I'm pleased that I'm able to give this talk on Valentine's Day. Thank you for celebrating the holiday with me. Um, I'd like to begin with an overview of the book as a whole. This project was motivated by several trends surrounding gender, work, and family in the United States. The gender revolution, or the movement of women into the paid labor force and men into the household and the family, has mostly stalled in the 21st century. Scholars generally point to cultural norms and structural factors to explain this persistent inequality. Attitudes and beliefs about gender, work, and family, like the ones highlighted on the left by these GSS survey questions, link men to paid employment while linking women to unpaid family care. To be a good man, given these cultural logics, men must work for pay. And to be a good woman, women must put family first. These widely held beliefs about gender, work, and family are reinforced by the material conditions surrounding work and family. For instance, Americans lack paid time off for personal and family care, as you can see on the right side graphic, the orange on the map indicates countries in which there is no national paid parental leave. Paternity leave in particular is rare. So couples must fall back on individualized, often gender traditional solutions to balance their paid work and unpaid family responsibilities. These forces combine to produce and reproduce a gendered division of labor. However, cultural attitudes, workplace conditions, and public policies may be changing for contemporary young adults, particularly the highly educated. Growing proportions of those 18 to 34 years old strongly disagree that a gender traditional division of labor is better. And a few state and local governments, as well as various private employers, particularly those who employ the highly educated, have adopted policies to provide workers with benefits like paid family leave. Still, a gender equality paradox remains in which men and women endorse egalitarianism in their attitudes, but they reproduce inequality in their behaviors. These conditions in the stalled gender revolution frame my research on how coupled young professionals launch careers, build relationships, and start families. How do couples who expect equality and have ample workplace resources still end up with a gender unequal division of labor? And can this division of labor change over time? To answer these questions, I designed a multi-year interview study of young dual career couples. I recruited child-free different sex couples from a range of graduate and professional degree programs in a Midwestern metropolitan area to participate in a six-year study consisting of four interviews per person spaced out over time. I interviewed dual professional couples because these highly educated men and women with strong career orientations and high earnings potential 
we're well positioned culturally and structurally to contest gender inequality in work and family. I chose to talk to child-free men and women in their 20s and 30s who were transitioning from school to work because people navigating these demographically dense periods of adult, uh, early adulthood were especially likely to be making decisions about careers, relationships, and families, which made it easier for me as a researcher to observe gender dynamics in work and family pathways. We can talk more about sampling and recruitment after the talk, but my final sample included 40 people from 21 couples. 21 graduate and professional school students who were in the final year of their degree programs and 19 of the students' spouses or romantic partners. Most participants were white and were 28 years old on average at the beginning of my study. About half of the couples that I talked to were married and the median relationship length of all couples was five years. So most of these are long-term relationships. I'm happy to address sample limitations later on, but this study had several strengths for documenting couples' career launch and family formation pathways. This prospective design allowed me to capture career and family pathways as they unfolded organically over a six-year period. I conducted baseline time one interviews when men and women were preparing to graduate from school and started searching for jobs. I collected time two interviews several months after baseline when these men and women got jobs or did not get jobs and couples had to decide what to do. Then I conducted time three interviews about one year after baseline when men and women were settling into their new jobs or their new lives and adjusting to new responsibilities. Finally, I conducted time four interviews five years after time three to capture how people experienced advancing or changing their careers, getting married or breaking up and transitioning to parenthood or deciding to remain child-free indefinitely. My decision to interview partners separately also gave me more data compared to previous research that mostly collected interviews from women only. Decisions about work, relationships, and family life are often made by partners and not just individuals. Without interviews with men, we can't understand how conversations and interactions between partners can lead to different work and family outcomes for men and women. What I'll present today hopefully really highlights this point. In total, I have over 200 hours of interview data collected from in-person meetings, telephone calls, and Zoom video calls. To provide a theoretically grounded analysis of couples' work and family pathways, and to address my research questions, how do couples launch careers, build relationships, and start families? How do couples who expect equality still end up with inequality? And can this arrangement change over time? I developed a work family ecosystems framework for examining structure, culture, and joint action among partners. Earlier, I said that structural conditions and cultural forces both contribute to the stalled gender revolution. Sociologists also recognize that individual agency although bounded by social structures and cultural norms, still matters for the advancement of the gender revolution. While we have theoretical tools for understanding how an individual interacts within their society, we have relatively fewer tools for talking about how two actors navigate their society together as a unit. I build on Shin Kapan and Phyllis Smoen's concept of coupled careers to consider how structure, culture, and joint action might look in the context of a marriage or a romantic partnership. The coupled careers model views men's and women's professional careers as interlocking within a relationship, as you can see in the up and down arrows on the left side of this figure. Partners' family careers are intertwined as well, as you can see in the up and down arrows on the right. 
and family careers refer to the roles that men and women play in their relationships and in their families. Partners' family careers are intertwined with their professional careers, as denoted by the left and right arrows across the work and family quadrants. This entire web of two careers and a shared relationship and family life evolves over time as couples move across life stages, as visualized here by these grids marked by T0, T1, T2, and T3. I start with this focus on partners' interactions within a dyad, and I add a more explicit discussion of power in my work family ecosystems framework. Scholars usually think that having more resources like income and status means that a person has more power. They also believe that doing more unpaid or devalued labor in the domestic sphere means a person has less power. In a dual career relationship, men may have relatively greater power due to their structural advantage in the workplace. And women may have relatively less power especially because they also face stronger cultural imperatives about doing unpaid labor for their relationships and families. These structural conditions and cultural norms might encourage couples to take gender complementary action to adopt a division of labor in which men pursue employment activities that may ultimately afford them even more power in society while pointing women towards home-centered activities that are less likely to give them power. But dual career couples might recognize the power imbalance associated with gender complementarity, and they might seek to avoid disempowering each other. Partners might coordinate with each other as they consider their structural and cultural resources and constraints as a unit. One partner's opportunities and constraints can become incorporated into the other's set of perceived opportunities and constraints. Partners might give work-related resources to each other and take on even amounts of relationship and family responsibilities to move forward together equally in their two professional and family careers. The work family ecosystems framework also more clearly specifies how a couple's division of labor may crystallize or change over time. The coming together of structural supports or constraints, egalitarian or inegalitarian cultural attitudes, and multiple possible forms of joint action creates a self-reinforcing equilibrium for the partner's web of coupled careers. Workplace conditions and cultural beliefs enable certain kinds of joint action. At the same time, partners' coordinated behaviors can set them up to experience specific workplace conditions, which in turn can inform their attitudes about what is possible for future actions. This feedback between structure, culture, and joint action perpetuates this equilibrium and produces path dependence in couples' work-family trajectories. When couples encounter supportive structural conditions, culturally support egalitarianism, and jointly take action to make the most of these favorable conditions, we could expect to see egalitarian work-family trajectories. But this equilibrium can be an unstable one. That's why I chose an image of a sphere balancing on top of a hill on top of an upside down parabola. A change in the partner's work related conditions, their cultural attitudes, or the way that they take action together may ripple out to alter the ecosystem of their coupled careers. I imagine that it's really hard to keep this ball balanced here at the top and pretty easy to knock it off this peak or this vertex. If couples face challenging structural conditions at work, if they express attitudinal support for gender traditionalism, or if partners do not successfully coordinate their actions to use the resources available to them to facilitate equal sharing, 
we might be more likely to see gender unequal work family pathways. Again, feedback between structure, culture, and joint action encourages path dependence. And this new work family equilibrium might set in over time. Here, I'm using the image of a sphere sitting at this valley or at this low point of the parabola because existing structures and cultural norms make it pretty hard to be anywhere else that is not this gender unequal work family equilibrium. Chapters two, three, and four of my book describe the three work family pathways that couples traveled over six years. Chapter two describes the consistent compromisers um, who mostly experienced an egalitarian work family ecosystem over time. These partners had consistent access to supportive workplace conditions. They held fast to their egalitarian beliefs and they regularly coordinated their actions to um, make the most of their resources and navigate their constraints together. In particular, the consistent compromiser men use their workplace advantages to support women's careers and to enable their own participation in domestic and family activities. Over the six years of the study, the biggest threat to this ecosystem was workplace discrimination against women. Chapter four describes the tending traditional couples who fell into a gender unequal work family arrangement early on and got stuck there over time. These partners faced relatively greater work-related challenges, were more open to temporarily having a gender division of labor, and they took gender complementary actions to meet their work and family responsibilities. When men in the tending traditional couples faced prolonged unemployment, Couples mobilized to get him a job, no matter the cost to women's careers. It was hard to change this work family ecosystem over time as men became specialized as earners and women became specialized as caregivers. For the rest of the talk, I wanna dive into chapter three with you. This chapter centers on the autonomous actors who experienced the most surprising pathway to me. Like the consistent compromisers, autonomous actors had good access to workplace supports to facilitate gender equality in work and family. However, they stood out in their attitudes about what gender egalitarianism meant. First, they expressed support for men's and women's equal right to pursue their best individual opportunities. Second, they believed that men and women were equally responsible for preserving their partner's autonomy by refraining from holding each other back in their pursuits. This gender neutral logic was paired with a gendered pattern of action in which men passively stated their support for whatever women wanted to do but many women actively compromised their careers for the couple. Structure, culture, and partners parallel but mismatched actions came together to produce a unique six-year trajectory for the autonomous actors. At time one, when partners began looking for jobs, men independently planned their own career launches but women more often made interdependent plans that accounted for the relationship. When actual job offers did or did not come through several months later at time two, men deferred to women to make whatever decision they thought would be best, which effectively left the fate of the couple and their two careers to women. Most women opted for long distance relationships to allow both partners to separately pursue their careers. Other women compromised on their own careers to keep the relationship together, sometimes by suspending their career pursuits indefinitely. The couple's work family outcomes at time three varied depending on women's access to structural support and the actions that they took at time two. 
what was consistent across these three time points was that women did more work to manage the ongoing uncertainties in the partner's two careers or their relationship. If women did not do this coordination work, partners broke up. This gender neutral autonomous logic leading to gender imbalanced compromising for the relationship changed over time over the next five years leading up to time four when both men and women made couple focused rather than autonomous work and family decisions. I'll illustrate this six year trajectory with Max and Julie's story. Julie and Max met in college and they started dating after they had been friends for a few years. Julie was a year behind Max in school and they both wanted to be doctors in the future. They ended up going to separate medical schools in different cities and maintained a long distance relationship the whole time. They hoped that their next step of training, medical residency, would finally put them together in the same city. Once they were in the same place, they would make more serious plans for living together, getting married, and perhaps having children. When I interviewed Max at time one, he was several months into his first year of residency at a hospital in a fairly remote region of the United States. When I asked him how he came to choose this program, knowing that Julie would be applying for medical residencies too, he said, out of all the places I interviewed, I liked this hospital the best. Knowingly, it wasn't ideal for our relationship. It would have probably been better to go to places where there would be more programs for Julie to apply to. So it was maybe not the best decision at that point, but it was the place that I liked best. Max explained that although he and Julie discussed locations that could work for both of them, he ultimately chose the best option for his own career and wanted Julie to do the same. He said, I'm supportive of her applying everywhere. And if she found a place she really wants to go more than anything, she should go and we would make it work. Although Max assumed that each person would pick the best place for themselves professionally, Julie emphasized wanting to be in the same location as Max when she chose her residencies. She said, Mountain West Hospital is at the absolute top of the places I wanted to apply to because Max had already matched there the year before. I kind of decided based on the fact that he was there and that we were trying to be in the same place or at least the same geographic location. Julie said she made an independent choice to restrict her applications, but it was Max's decision to train at this specific hospital that led Julie to prioritize her application here at time one. She even said later on in her interview, would Max's hospital be number one if Max wasn't there? I don't know. Julie made interdependent plans while Max made independent ones. These gendered actions lined up with the autonomous actor's gender neutral logics though, because Max and Julie were free to make independent choices and neither of them would actively hold each other back in their respective careers. However, Max and Julie enacted these beliefs differently, such that Julie compromised her career more than Max did. The partners could dismiss this inequality in the level of effort that they put into coordinating their two careers because they could point to a gender neutral logic that drove their actions. At time two, regardless of whether partners secured job offers, autonomous actor men left it up to women to take whatever actions they believed would be best. For example, Max said, I mean, we didn't make any specific contingency plans other than we would figure it out, make it work some way or another. He was doing what he would have been doing in his residency all along and had no specific ideas for what to do if Julie did not match to his hospital. He wanted to let Julie decide for herself what was best for her. Autonomous actor women reacted to men's hands-off stance in various ways, 
depending on their access to external resources to facilitate two careers and a relationship in the same place. Women's wide ranging actions in this ecosystem of workplace conditions, autonomous attitudes, and a lack of coordinated action, therefore began to channel autonomous actor couples towards different outcomes at time two. Julie happened to have a high level of access to professional resources to support a dual career relationship. Between time one and time two, she found out about and made use of a formal program that could increase her chances of matching to Max's Hospital. She said, I went to Max's Hospital to do an away rotation there. If you really need to end up in an area, it's sometimes a good idea to do a rotation there so that the program knows who you are. If you go and work really hard and they like you, it can be a boost up. In my specialty, Away rotations are not required unless you have a really good reason for why you would want to end up at a certain place. So because I had a really good reason why I would want to end up there, I ended up going out there. Julie did this extra work to increase her chances of reuniting the couple while still advancing the partner's two careers. Max did not put in an equal amount of work to support the dual career couple. This gender unequal burden of taking action to achieve two careers while sustaining a relationship became even more pronounced when Julie explained that things would have been a lot easier if the partners had used a couple's matching policy from the start. Hospitals hire medical resident partners as a package to help couples stay together while still getting professional training. Max never thought to explore this option when he started his residency applications because he wanted to give Julie freedom to make an independent choice for her own career. He didn't want to unduly influence Julie's decisions and compromise her autonomy. And Julie never asked Max to take her into account because she wanted to preserve his autonomy too. At time three, Julie matched to Max's hospital, moved in with him, and started working as a medical resident. For this couple, attitudes around autonomy came together with workplace supports that Julie independently leveraged to produce roughly gender equal outcomes in careers that also ended the partner's long distance. In Max and Julie's story, we can see that a gender equal outcome can result from gender unequal processes, as well as mask a gender unequal power dynamic in which women worked harder than men to get an outcome that both people wanted. Other women had fewer external resources to draw on. When things didn't work out, and men told women to do whatever they thought was best, some women like Janelle chose to suspend their careers to keep the couple together. Janelle couldn't figure out how to pursue her PhD at a university abroad while her husband, Stephen worked on his PhD in the United States when she found out that they were expecting a baby. Stephen wanted her to make her own decision. So Janelle abandoned her PhD plans. She assumed there was no way to make it all work because she couldn't ask Stephen to compromise his autonomy and his right to fully pursue his career by asking that he write up his dissertation remotely from her university. By time three, Janelle was at home full time with a newborn and Stephen was preparing to graduate from his program and was looking for jobs widely. This couple's story provides some answers regarding how aspiring dual career couples with access to workplace supports like remote work arrangements can still end up with gender inequality. In making space for Janelle to make her own choices, Stephen effectively excused himself 
from actively pursuing his remote work option to facilitate Janelle's PhD completion. Stephen failed to leverage the resource for his partner and for the couple. Janelle wasn't in the same position to take advantage of a remote work option in her program. She felt stigmatized as a pregnant person requesting remote work arrangements and decided to drop the PhD conversation and leave her studies altogether. Other women like Cassandra prioritized their own careers at time two when men said that they should make their own choices. In choosing a long distance relationship, Cassandra thought that she could allow both partners to continue their careers. However, Cassandra found herself doing more work than David to manage the long distance partnership. And she broke up with him by time three when she got tired of being the only person putting in effort to sustain the couple. This couple's story reinforces my point that gender equality in work family outcomes can sometimes mask gender inequality in work family processes. Women did more work than men to maintain the partner's two careers and their relationship. This power imbalanced equilibrium in which men's careers and the couple benefited from women's invisible work was not set in stone, however. Over time, the autonomous actors came to make career, relationship, and family decisions more interdependently. This was also true of the autonomous actor couples that broke up. These men and women took more coordinated actions with their new partners. Let's return to Max and Julie. Five years later, at time four, both of them had completed their medical residencies and were working as medical fellows, still at the same hospital. They got married a few years ago and were raising a six month old baby. Because medical fellowships are short term positions, Julie and Max were actively looking for jobs again. This time, Max explicitly took Julie's career into account. He said, we have to find jobs for both of us. So we're weighing what each of us wants and what sacrifice each of us is willing to make. I'm more flexible on whether it's an academic job or if it's private practice. Julie definitely wants to do academic medicine. So it narrows it down pretty quick to a handful of places. She started reaching out to the places, talking to their program chairs. Then I went based on those locations, just started applying. Whereas at time one, Max pursued career opportunities that benefited him, regardless of its impact on Julie. At time four, Max actively considered Julie's careers, uh, Julie's career. He sent applications wherever she had professional leads and used his own flexibility to support Julie's narrower job search. What changed in these five years was men's growing confidence in their professional security. Max continued, the people she works with here have been enthusiastic about hiring her to stay. Now it looks like they would hire me at a nearby hospital. I mean, there's demand for physicians. So there's always a chance that one of us could take a job and the other one could just wait and see. But right now it's looking pretty good that we'll have an opportunity to stay here for both of us. Max's increased confidence on the labor market helped him more actively support Julie's career. He insisted that there was a demand for doctors so he could find a job anywhere that Julie wanted to take a job. In addition to men's growing confidence, men's new focus on their children shaped their attitudes about work and their personal lives. Max said, I always knew that I would wanna make sure my career allowed me to spend a good amount of time with family and kids. Now actually looking at jobs, I guess it's more clear what that looks like. For example, if I got the opportunity to do an academic job where I had ideal research opportunities, but would be working all the time versus a career that had less ideal academic opportunities and more time with family, I would take the second one. Max enjoyed parenting, 
So he was willing to take a job that was less ideal to him professionally if it gave him more time to invest in his family. Together, changes in Max's structural context, his increased access to jobs, and his new parental status prompted attitude changes that led him to take more interdependent rather than autonomous actions in his life with Julie. Max's new pattern of actions did not go unnoticed. Julie said, I feel like we've grown together instead of individually or separately. It feels more like it's a partnership and we're evenly sharing dinner and cleaning and baby care and walking the dog and all that kind of stuff. I think that although the scales are tipped pretty heavily towards work for the two of them, I think that the balance right now, it's pretty good. Experiencing this work family equilibrium for the last several years and seeing how the two of them collaboratively sustained it made Julie feel hopeful that they, continue, that they could continue this rhythm even as they prepared for another life change with their current job search. Let's zoom back out again to my research questions. How do dual professional couples launch careers, build relationships, and start families? The general answer is that it depends on the confluence of structure, culture, and joint action. A more specific answer is that some couples follow the autonomous actor pathway. Regardless of whether partners had work-related resources to support their dual career relationship, attitudes favoring men's and women's equal right to make individual choices, and men's and women's equal responsibility to allow each partner to maintain autonomy led to gendered actions in which men focused on their own career plans without considering the relationship, while women did a lot to coordinate all of the moving parts. How do couples who expect equality, and have resources to realize it, still end up with a gender unequal division of labor. Scholars repeatedly point to work-related challenges that bar men and women from having equal partnerships. But the autonomous actor pathway shows that structural support for egalitarianism might not be enough if partners endorse autonomy instead of active collaboration and do not make use of their professional resources to benefit each other. I think that the autonomous actor trajectory really showcases that what it means to have gender equality in work and family can be complicated. Sometimes the gender unequal burden of work in which women made more career compromises than men still resulted in gender equal outcomes insofar as both people got jobs and kept the relationship going in the short term. When these outcomes were equal, couples could disregard the gendered imbalance processes that got them there. And this allows gender inequality to persist in men's and women's experiences of attaining these outcomes. The autonomous actor pathway further complicates the idea of gender equality in work and family by highlighting that egalitarianism isn't a static trait, trait that is fundamental to individuals or couples. Egalitarianism is an equilibrium that people can move in and out of over time, depending on their workplace circumstances, their cultural attitudes, and how coordinated or mismatched the partner's actions are. And this ties into my third question. Can a couple's division of labor change over time? The case of the autonomous actors suggests yes. Although men initially worked less actively to support the couple than women did, over the long term, men came to make more compromises in their careers like the women did to support their partner's careers and their families. Changes in structural conditions that prompted attitude changes spurred different patterns of behavior in work and family on this pathway.
What does the autonomous actor trajectory tell us about the stalled gender revolution? I think this case shows us that the gender revolution is likely to advance in some ways while hitting new snags in the future. As we've seen, holding gender neutral attitudes rather than gender traditional ones still does not necessarily produce gender equal behaviors. And gender unequal processes can sometimes still lead to gender equal outcomes. What I hope this in-depth qualitative study invites survey researchers to do is develop additional measures to capture these sorts of gendered work family behaviors in larger samples of dual earner couples. Because just focusing on outcomes like women's employment broadly might lead us to overestimate how much progress we've made towards gender equality. I also think this study makes a case for developing some additional measures around gender neutral attitudes because these people were not necessarily endorsing gender traditional attitudes, but still ended up with a gender division of labor. What I hope my work demonstrates to policymakers and couples on the ground is that workplace and structural support for dual career couples is crucial for gender equality. Julie would not have been likely to make it all work out for her and Max if she didn't have options to help her land a job at Max's hospital. But we also need to frame work-family balance as a collective responsibility. It can't just be Julie's job to find resources for her and Max. It's Max's job as well. Men can more conscientiously use their resources to facilitate equal participation in work and family, and not just leave it up to women to hold a work family ecosystem together for the couple. Ideally, we'd have a whole society working to make this possible for two working partners. I wanna stop at this point because I would love to hear your questions and have more of a conversation with you. I'm happy to say more about the autonomous actors or the other couples in the book. We can go back to study design, research methods and theory, or we can continue discussing implications of this work for couples, workplaces and policy. I can also tell you about what's coming next and some of the new research that I'm doing um, that grew out of this work. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. Phyllis. I really enjoyed this and I enjoyed the focus on the autonomous action. But do you want to tell us something about the other two groups and their points? Um sure. Okay, so I gave a, a general overview. The consist. Oh, yes, right. I'm sorry. Um, Phyllis asked if I could speak a little bit more about the other couples in this book. The two other pathways are the consistent compromisers and the tending traditional couples. So the consistent compromisers were men and women who came into this job search with a different idea of what gender egalitarianism in work and family meant. To these couples, um, gender egalitarianism meant that both people worked equally to support both people's participation in work and in family. So their ethos was, we do everything together. So the consistent compromisers really did very narrow job searches, you know, targeting one or two cities that absolutely worked for both partners' careers. For most of these couples, things worked out because of strong structural support. So people took advantage of partner hiring policies. People took advantage of um, really portable careers that had multiple geographic hubs. Um, and I think for, for the consistent compromisers, sometimes having dual professional couples where both people worked in policy ended up helping because then they could target places like Washington, D.C., where um, both people could do policy relevant work um, and not 
have to give anything up. Over time, the consistent compromisers um, became parents, many of them, and that same ethos of we do everything together continued. So men and women told stories about taking joint parental leave to learn how to be parents together. And so they built up this habit of one of us steps in when one of us has to step out. Both of us know how to bathe the baby. The baby likes both of us. So it does not become gendered in the way that it is very common. It happens, right? Um, but these consistent compromisers were really deliberate and again, supported by their workplaces to be able to take things like parental leave and, and have three months together to learn how to be new parents. The biggest challenge that the consistent compromisers faced in maintaining equality in two careers and at home was that women reported harassment and discrimination at work that partners simply could not respond to. Um, partners did try to help each other insofar as men would coach women in practicing interview questions to try to find a new job. They would look over each other's resumes to, you know, polish it up so that you can start making your exit. Um, and men really stepped up to become more than equal partners at home um, to free up time for women to focus on this job search to get out of their toxic work environments. But this really shows that, you know, having these egalitarian attitudes and, and having, having these um, joint collective collaborative behaviors is not necessarily enough if the challenge is workplaces are not supportive of women and there's harassment going on. Okay, so that's the consistent compromisers. The tending traditional couples um, were pretty fascinating to me because the sense that I got from them was that they hadn't 100% realized that establishing a gender traditional division of labor early on would be so impactful for their trajectory moving forward. A lot of them said, we can always switch roles later on. And my six years of studying them suggested that it, it just did not happen. So these tending traditional couples um, faced relatively more difficult structural conditions. They had harder time finding jobs. So their unemployment periods were a little bit longer. And I think that that long unemployment period really activated this kind of latent attitude endorsing gender traditionalism. These couples kind of said, gender traditionalism is fine for now. We can fix it later. Right now, both of us are having a really hard time finding jobs. So what if we focus on getting him a job first and we'll figure it out later? Most of the time, getting men a job um, really ruled out a lot of career opportunities for women. Any unemployment that happened was really concentrated on the tending traditional pathway in this particular study. So a lot of the times it would be men really widely applied for jobs, wherever they landed, that's where the couples went. And women found that these labor markets were pretty unfriendly or not helpful to their own careers. And, and with this kind of division of labor established, over time, it became really difficult for the couples to justify giving up this thing that worked really well for their families. Men were earning a lot of money, being specialized as earners in their family, and they provided benefits like health insurance. A lot of people told me, I'm staying here because of the health insurance, my kid needs to be covered. And they just did not think that women, after having been out of the labor force for several years, could pick back up and provide their families with the same level of, um, quality of life if they were to then reinvest in her job. For whatever reason, the couples didn't consider a different option of, well, what if we have her also return to work but not necessarily be a primary earner? But I think that that ties to a lack of childcare, good quality childcare available in the United States. These women said a lot that I'm providing free childcare I know what's going on with the kids and 
we feel good about how our kids are being taken care of day to day. I don't know if we can find something like that if I were to return to work. Um, so they, they really just felt stuck and didn't know what to do to break out of this pattern. Um, and I think it's because we have these kinds of structural conditions in the United States. So that's a very broad overview. <laughs> I see. Okay, the follow-up question was, which was the most common? So there were 21 couples in my study. There were eight consistent compromisers, seven tending traditional couples, and six autonomous actors. Numbers in a qualitative study, I'm always a little bit wary of. And that's why I would love to develop some sort of broader survey measure to administer to dual earner couples to get a sense of how common is the consistent compromiser ethos really in this population of dual earners? How, how common is this autonomous logic really um, among a broader population? I've played around with the idea of vignettes. Um, you know, which couple do you think you sound the most like? We'll see how it goes. That was one of the failed chapters of my dissertation, but you know, <laughs> we'll pick that up again. Okay, Jana. Hey, Jacqueline, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. All right, sweet. Um, so super interesting, love this work. Um, I mean, I'm saying that as somebody who doesn't do qualitative work, so <laughs> it's a high compliment. Um, but anyway, I was wondering, and maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but did you find anything about whether um, any of these couples, you know, talked about marriage, you know, in terms of how did that fit into this, um, you know, joint location, especially because, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, I mean, all of us in, in academia, you know, think about, you know, in terms of having it as a signal, you know, in terms of what's going on with your with your personal life when you're when you're um, looking for jobs and, and things. So I'm wondering if, if there were any differences or if that came up at all um, for, for those couples who weren't married at the, at the beginning of your study. Thank Great. you. Great, yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, so I purposely um, constructed a sample where half the people were married and half the people were unmarried precisely to get at these sorts of issues. So I was again surprised by what I found. Um, the married couples were most likely to follow the consistent compromiser pathway or the tending traditional pathway. I think previous research would have suggested that people who are married might have just more traditional attitudes about relationships um, and things like that, but I actually found that it was not 100% the case. So in the consistent compromiser pathway, marriage for these partners meant that we are making a promise to each other to support each other in our joint pursuits. We are building a life together. So you can't just run off and do whatever you want to do. We need to be doing everything together. For the tending traditional couples, marriage to them was framed more like the relationship needs to be the primary thing whatever is good for keeping the relationship together. So for those tending traditional couples, long distance was less often um, a suitable uh, compromise or solution to dual career problems. It was the relationship is number one and how it played out for the tending traditional couples was that women said, fine, I give up the career for now because the relationship is number one. The autonomous actors were the least likely to be married at the beginning of my study. So most of my unmarried couples were falling into the autonomous actor trajectory. And I really do think that that ties into that individualized logic where yes, we're a couple and most of my couples were long-term couples, right? Five years was the median time that these people um, had been together. Many of them were living together. And so I thought, maybe I wouldn't see too much of a difference, but with these autonomous actors, they, they discussed marriage as just a piece of paper. We've been living together for so long that I can't imagine it changing the way that we interact with each other. But I, I think that maybe they were um, not noticing that they were using these more independent or autonomous logics um, in not being married. And so over time, as they 
got married, you know, started having kids and things, the logic kind of became more us instead of two separate me's who happen to be traveling together and it's fun. Okay. Yes, Anne. Yeah, I have a question about um, maybe before, or if you have any insight about before you captured them in the first interview, maybe when they were starting in their graduate careers to specialize, um, even maybe within occupations, you used Max and Julie who were in, med in the medical field. And I feel like I've been reading more and more about gender specialization within occupations. So more women mm -hmm. will go into family practice mm -hmm. because of what they imagine their futures to be like, and maybe more men will go into surgery. Or I don't, I don't know what the analogous masculinized kind of, or if it even needs to be masculinized sort of uh, within occupation job would be. But do, do you have any insight about how when you came to them, they were already mm -hmm. kind of gendering their future? Okay, so the question is whether I can tell from my interviews, even before they got to me, were they already starting to choose these kind of gendered careers or occupations um, to take into account family stuff, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I also think like, for example, in medical practice, family, uh, like family medicine, you would probably be able to find a job anywhere. Right. So it might also affect right. The yeah. So, um, so my research seems to be in line with Erin Sex research um, on this sort of topic, where she finds that these family plans, maybe scholars are making a bigger deal out of it than it seems to play out for couples on the ground. So I rarely talk to anyone who said, I chose this because I imagine myself in the future as having kids and I want that flexibility. I think that perhaps it's because I chose these, you know, really career focused people who I think envision themselves like, well, I'm going to be a lawyer and that's my career and like, we'll figure out the kids thing when we get there. A lot of people said, we'll figure out the kids thing when we get there. Many of them, when I started this study, said, we'll talk about that in three to five years. We'll like not even start to talk about it um, until later. So I think these people are really focused on let's get these careers figured out first before we put anything else onto our plate. So it felt like career was kind of the baseline and everything else fits in on top or between it. Have another question online? Um, I'm not sure. I can ask something else. <laughs> Go ahead, Jenna. Oh, thanks, guys. Um, so, have you thought about like what sort of? I'm like thinking about um, surveys that you could potentially add questions to about this. So the ones that come to my mind, and I'm sure you've thought about this before, is like the NSCG or the survey of earned doctorates, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I so think that- What sort of that, questions would you want on there? I'm just more curious about that. Yeah, what kind of questions do I want on there? Yeah, I think the, the challenge was that I, I couldn't find any surveys that had the questions that I wanted to ask. And so I went on to this interview study. Um, I, I think that the vignette idea would be fine. I think I just did not have enough resources as a graduate student to execute it well. Um, I think that I think that presenting people with scenarios, you know, consider Max and Julie. This is their situation. What would you do? Um, and kind of seeing, would they say both people should pursue their careers separately and do long distance? Should they say, Max needs to stop considering this location because it's really bad for Julie? Or would they say, well, Julie should just go along and it'll probably work out. I think that could tap into some of the logics that these consistent compromisers, autonomous actors intending traditional couples um, are using. I also think that asking questions about what people themselves have done would be so fascinating because it, it's one thing to say, I would do what the consistent compromisers did and we should only target places that work for both of us. But have you ever done that for real with your partner? 
And what has that pattern looked like actually in your life would be pretty interesting to me. Okay. Yeah, One I definitely question. the latter. <laughs> So what, what we're going to do is, Audrey, you ask your question, and those who have to leave will just leave right now. Go ahead, Audrey. Okay. Thank you. Um, this was a really interesting talk where I kept on trying to figure out which one I was. Um, but. <laughs> My um, my question was, um, I know you said most of the sample was white, but if there were any differences, um, if there were like black women, because sometimes like, I guess sometimes in terms of gender role and working, um, I feel like there's a narrative that, oh, at least in the U.S., I hear the narrative that, oh, black women always worked and didn't necessarily stay at home. So I'm just wondering if any of the results differed or if you could see any differences by the racial composition of the couples. And also, and I guess if you had like interracial also in there. Yeah. So this was a, a pretty small sample and a pretty homogenous sample. And, you know, I think that the, the good that comes out of a research design like that is that I can really pinpoint that it's gender happening, but here it's gender operating in the case of highly educated, mostly white, mostly same race couples. So I can make some hypotheses about what I think would go on if I had more um, racial and ethnic minorities in my sample. There were some, but I, I really hesitate to make bigger claims because they're, you know, one case is, is just one case. Um, I think that the idea that spouses le leveraging resources for each other is potentially more difficult for um, racial and ethnic minorities. I think, you know, for black women, there's these stereotypes of like, you know, the angry black woman. And what does it mean that this, this woman in particular is asking for spousal accommodations? Is it going to come off in a way that is going to jeopardize her ability to get a job. Um, I think that I think that racial and ethnic minorities might also come into the situation with a broader set of logics for how to approach these work family issues. So the idea that men are breadwinners and women are homemakers is really a white, like upper middle class thing. There could be just very different approaches to what does it mean for us to be a family? And what does it mean for us to be a dual earner family? And what does it mean for us to be co-parents or you know, equal domestic partners? So I would love to see a study like this um, with a more heterogeneous population. So somebody else maybe can do that or, or help me do that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And for those of you who have other questions, please feel free to contact yeah. Professor Long. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.